What causes conflict in the church? We must remember that the letter to James is written to Christians. It's written to those folks who claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've been in a church for any number of years, and as we have been for many, many years, you will find that over the years there are various times when we will experience strife in the church, dissensions and factions and strife, conflict. The question is, is it the leadership style? Is it the financial issues that cause stress? Is it doctrine? Is it cultural issues? Is it vision? What causes strife? And uh, as I said, over the years, we've experienced our fair share. I wasn't always in, in full-time ministry, so we, we experienced the whole gambit of every possible thing that people could fight about, about baptism, about the charismatic gifts versus the cessation of the charismatic gifts, about um, founder members and incomers, people who thought that they owned the church and the others came in later, the elite versus the, the common people. And so the list goes on and on. And we experience all of that. And uh, a few years back, I, I read a Christianity Today survey and it said, they wanted to find out what the main cause of strife and conflict in the church is. And you know what they found was the main cause, all these other things are just, are just facades behind which people hide. But the first of all is control, power, and personal preference. It's control, power, and personal preference. And so today, that's what we're going to look at. What is the root cause of bitter strife? And James asked that question in verse 1. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you, among you believers? What, what is the source of worldly antagonisms and strife and warfare? And then he gives the answer. He says, don't they come from desires that battle within you. And the word there for desires is the word hedone. It's where we get our word hedonism from. You know what hedonism is? To give yourself over to pleasure. That is what hedonism is. So he says it comes from your, your, this philosophy that pleasure is the chief source of life. So if I want to live a a good life in this world, I must give myself over to pleasure, my own satisfaction, my pleasure. And nothing can stand in the way. And then he says, he goes on in verse 2, and he says, you want something. And it's weak, the translation here in the NIV. It literally says, you lust or desire something, but you do not get it literally means you lust after this, this power, this, this indulgence, this pleasure. You kill and covet, but you don't have it. You quarrel and fight. We are willing to kill, not literally. It doesn't mean Christians go literally around killing each other, but they kill each other with the evil thoughts in their minds towards other believers. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you know, you've heard it said, you know, you shall not murder. You know that story? He says, but I tell you, if you look at someone in anger, you have the heart of a murderer. And James says the same thing. You can hear he is thinking of the words of Jesus here. And he says, we kill, we covet because we want. We don't get because we do not ask God. Why, why do people not Ask God when there is factions, when there is strife in the church. You know why? Because they will work it out themselves. They will form alliances. I speak to this one and you speak to that one and we build our alliances and we hope that we will oust the opposition. And it works like that. It's all about politics. It's all about plotting and planning and maneuvers. And we want to get it in the flesh. We want to do it in our own strength. 
Because that is the reason we, I can't ask God, say, Lord, I want to get rid of that guy. I really hate him. Won't you help me? You know, obviously you can't pray that. It doesn't work very well. So we don't ask God and we don't get. And when we ask, he says in verse 3, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. Say, Lord, make my life easier in church. You know that one family over there? Really, I would be glad, Lord, if they could leave. They would be blessed subtractions. And the Lord says, no, I put them there exactly because that is what the church needs. They will sharpen you as iron sharpens iron. And he says, you don't get because you ask with the wrong motives and you want to spend it on your own pleasures, on your own desires. And then he goes on and he rebukes this worldly attitude. And we can again consider what was said in, in chapter 3, verse 13 to 17 about that envy and selfish ambition. And he goes on and he speaks to the church and he calls them, you adulterous people. That's a good way to, to win friends and influence people. If the pastor would stand in front and say, you adulterous people, which again is, is quite a nice way of saying it. What he actually means, you warmongers. That's the way that James is addressing these people because the word is actually nice in Greek, mochalides. You know, it's like a, almost like a swear word. You can use it to swear at a Greek if you find one. It's evocative. It's a way that you express yourself. Mochalides, adulterous people, warmongers. And it's blunt, and it's meant to shock us because James doesn't want us to have this kind of attitude. We get what we want, and we will do whatever we can to have it our way. And he uses this, this word. Why does he use it? Because in the Old Testament, Israel was the wife of God, not literally, but spiritually. In the New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ. And when we have an alternative source of our desire and our love, we become adulterous. We become spiritually unfaithful. We, when our desire is not fully focused on God, our love is not fully focused on God, but on my own wants and my own needs, then I become a friend of the world. In verse 4b, he says, anyone chooses who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You see, ultimately, <coughs> my friends, there are only two options. You're either a friend of God or you're a friend of the world. Again, you can hear in the background Jesus speaking. You can't serve God and money. You will either serve the one or you serve the other. You can't love both. And so it's again with these desires that, that war inside my mind. And I want it my way. I want the hymns that I want to sing. I want to, to worship and fellowship in the way I want. And he says, no. Friendship with the world. And he, when he means the world, he doesn't mean the earth. He means the system of the world, the thinking of the world, the way the world thinks. The world says, you get what you want. You deserve this. This should be yours. Take it. And if you can't get it, get rid of those who stand in your way. And James says, that's a worldly attitude. That's the way the wicked and those who are opposed to God, that's how they win their way. Especially pleasures that lure people's hearts away from God. It's the old age-old lie that you find in the Garden of Eden. You can be like God. You remember what the serpent said to Adam or to Eve? You can be like God. God says, no, this is how it is. But, you know, God's actually trying to withhold something from you. You can be like God yourself, deciding for yourself what is right and wrong. And then he says, but friendship with the world is hatred towards God. People in church, 
And as I said, we've seen it over the years. They promote what they think is God's way. Whether it's baptism, whether it's hymns that they sing, whether it's the way they want the church to be inside, whether they like this kind of music, whether there must be flowers in the church or not be flowers in the church, whatever thing they have in mind, and they say it's for God. We want to do it for God. And they spiritualize it. Because it's always easy to fight a fight if God's on your side. Then the other person must be wrong. Because God's on my side. But James is saying, what is really driving you? Is it God or is it your own evil desires? And then he goes on in verse 5 and he says, Do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he calls to live in us envies intensely? How does the spirit envy intensely? Well, the, the spirit desires us to be his. The Spirit wants our full commitment and devotion. The Spirit does not want us to love the things of the world or the ideas of the world or what I can get for myself. It's the old idea that we get from Exodus 34 verse 14 where God tells us that He's a jealous God. There's no place for another lover. He says, do not worship any other God, for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. I remember we had a, a church member who was quite, quite upset when we spoke about this jealousy. You know, he said, jealousy is a bad thing. My friends, jealousy is not always a bad thing. When you're married and somebody hits on your husband or your wife, then jealousy is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Who, who doesn't care what, what happens to someone he loves or she loves? And this is the same with God. If we are his bride, he doesn't want to share us with anybody else. In the Ten Commandments, he says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, is a jealous God. It's a jealous God. And then he says, Do you think that the Scripture speaks without reason? But the good news is, James says in verse 6, but he gives us more grace. And he says, Scripture says, God opposes the proud, the one who wants it his way or her way. I want it the way I want it and to hang with the rest. They can just go, they can leave. It's my way or the highway. And many churches operate like that, either by the pastor or the church council or the members, and there are all these factions. But James says God gives us more grace. He demands total de love and devotion. The world may attract us, but God will give us more grace. And if we run out of grace, he will give us some more. We just have to go to him. And he actually quotes there from Proverbs 3 verse 34. If you have a Bible there, you'll see there's a footnote it says there in, in Proverbs 3, 34, He mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. And the grace God gives is always far greater than what He demands. It will always be enough. It will never, you will never run out of grace. It will never get to a point where, where God's grace is just, just not enough. Like the Springboks yesterday. The, the, I, I thought they, they were running out of grace, but they just got enough. They just got it over the last hurdle. So the question now that may come to mind is, who are the humble? Who are these people who are humble? Who are these people who are willingly are willing to submit to God's desire? Those who are who do not proudly insist on their way, their desires, their pleasures. Those who are not 
characterized by strife and deceit and, this, and, and all kinds of arguments. Well, the answer, and how do we become humble? The answer is given in verses 7 to 10, the remedy, the remedy for godly reformation. Notice there in verse 7, there's a word then. Submit yourselves then. In other words, everything that has been said so far, then, considering those things, what must we do? And there are nine commands, nine imperatives, not suggestions. He says, this is what you do. If you want to reform spiritually, godly, you want to experience godly reformation, this is what you do. And verse 7 has got three of these commands. Submit, resist, and come near. Submit yourselves then to God. The first thing we need to do is to realize that God is in charge. He knows what is good for us. And whether I like it or not, I have to submit myself to God's way. If God says this is how it is, then that's how it is. And, and we find God's authority and God's commands in this book. It is there. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. Remember that submission is not obedience. Let me just say that. Submission is not obedience. Submission is a mindset. It's something which I... I'm thinking of something which I don't know if I should say now. In Ephesians 5, it says, husband, uh, wives, submit to your husbands. Now, that is a, that's a mindset. It's, it's, it's not obedience. It's a mindset. And once you change your mindset, then that leads to obedience. But if you don't agree with it, it will never work. And as you submit to God, the opposite is you've got to resist the devil. And then he will flee from you. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. I like the way that Martin Luther wrote it in A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Wonderful hymn. He says, For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. So he's a powerful enemy. But Martin Luther goes on and he says, Although this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, and one little word shall fell him. If God is on our side. And the third thing he says you must do, you must come near to God. So you submit to God's will, you resist the devil, and then you run to God and you cling to God. And you come near to God. Your selfish pleasures and, your, and your, your desires that make you drift away from God, this is how you resist them. And this is how you come near to God, and God will come near to you. And then he go, gives us two more commands in verse 8. Two more commands that has got to do with our doing and thinking. First, our submission and resistance, then how we do and how we think. Wash your hands, because your hands are what you used to do things. You use them to do bad things. And notice here, endearing himself to Christians once again. He already called them adulterers. Now he calls them sinners. And then he says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. So James is like, uh, I don't know how popular he was after this session. Adulterers, sinners, double-minded people. So you wash your hands, what you do, stop doing the wrong thing, and purify your hearts, renew your thinking. Renew your thinking. And then 
He calls us to repentance. Four calls to repentance. Grieve, mourn, wail, and change. And you notice that there's a progression. Grieve, mourn, wail, and then change. What do you do when you grieve? It's inside. You're grieving about something. You're grieving, in this case, about your sin. It's a word that means you must be miserable or wretched. That's how you grieve. It's not a happy thing. You feel miserable. And it's inside, and other people can't maybe see it. But I know, and you know, how evil we are. And I grieve about my sin and my, my pleasure and those things I seek so earnestly that is not what God wants. And then the second step is it's an intensification. He says mourn. When you mourn, people normally can notice that you're mourning. You're looking pretty glum. I've been at funerals and and somebody has lost a loved one, and they are white as a sheet. All the blood drains from their faces, and you, you see this, this, just this mourning, this terrible pain. And it's something that is visible. Other people can see it. And uh, what James is saying is we should be so serious about the sin, and how it separates us from God, that we should mourn. And then it gets even worse. In case people don't notice how you feel about sin, the next step is you must wail. You know how to wail. You need to wail. Instead of laughter, there should be wailing. We should cry out, weeping loud, so that people can see, I don't want to be this way. And then he says, the fourth one, change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. This, this doesn't mean Christians are miserable people, by the way. It doesn't mean Christians go around the world and they say, what a terrible world we live in. It's so miserable to be alive. That's not what he's saying. He says, no, this kind of attitude is specifically against that burning desire in your heart to get your own way, your pleasures. Christians can be happy people. But this is that sin of selfish ambition and bitter envy that causes fights, not just in the church, but also at home. There are many families that are going through this kind of thing where husband and wife cannot stand each other. And they are at each other. And they haven't got something good to say. I used to work in a in an engineering company and we had a tea room, a notorious tea room where we gathered on tea times and, and lunch times and sit in a circle and what the guys would sometimes say about their wives in that tea room was just shocking. And I think, what a miserable life to be married to somebody you despise. How can that work? And that's the kind of thing that he says we must mourn and change our attitude and grieve if this is the way we behave. And then he, he ends off with a reminder. He actually concludes the whole thing. He started in verse 6 by, by saying God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And now in verse 10 he says humble yourself before the Lord and he will li lift you up. And this is the reminder. Humble yourself. What does this sound like? Where have we heard this before? Humble yourself and God will lift you up. I think the clearest example is that of Jesus Christ. Where Paul writes to the Philippians and he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That, that exactly sounds like what James is saying. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Think of the other person. Consider that person better than yourselves. Who got this right? Your attitude should be the same 
as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing to taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Somebody asked me a week or so ago, what is my title? You know what Jesus' title was? A servant. I haven't come to be served, but to serve. I think that's a good title, servant. A servant, a slave, a bond servant. And it says, Jesus found himself in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and he became obedient even to death on the cross. And therefore, God exalted him. To the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord. And Paul says to the Philippians this is how you should be. Consider others better than yourselves. My friends if the church of Jesus Christ can get this right, then we will never have church splits or church factions. Then we will be able to talk about our differences and say, well, I understand your point. Let's agree to disagree and let's go forward because there's a greater cause. And it will be the same in our marriages, in our families where we don't desire our way. And if we don't get what we want, we will fight until we overcome. The Bible says, no, overcome that which is warring in your soul. Submit yourself to God. He will give you grace and he will lift you up. Amen.